Thank you everyone um, for joining us for another uh, installment of Job Search Strategies. Uh, we're going to hear today from Dr. Jim Fahey. Uh, he received his undergrad at Xavier University and he did his graduate work uh, at Cornell. I don't wanna take away from his talk, but he's going to walk you through his sort of career trajectory and his career journey. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Jim Fahey and Jim, go ahead. Thank you, Joe. Um, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to everybody this afternoon and uh, virtual also, but I think we're all getting used to this virtual world over the, uh, the last few months anyway, and uh, a little bit, bit strange for some of us. I, I like to normally walk around a lot and move my hands a lot and, uh, and get excited, but I, uh, I'll, I'll try to sing virtually. But today I, I want to talk a little bit, in fact, mostly uh, about just my career path, and uh, I'll start very early on, but take you through uh, both some of the university experiences and maybe some of the experiences you guys are going through now in terms of um, making some tough decisions. And then take you through my career, uh, a variety of companies and a variety of positions and, a, uh, and some technical, some business. And I think some of the, probably some of the same issues you're gonna face and encounter, I think, as you go through your career and make some of those, those decisions. Um, I'll, I'll start way back. Uh, I actually uh, was born and grew up in a small little town in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia, Canada. So way in the East Coast there a little bit of uh, extra snow and hope, hopefully some of you guys might've had a chance to visit, but it's a very nice small little uh, island up there. Um, I have six siblings, three brothers, three sisters. Uh, so I was a, a middle child and maybe that explains some of my, uh, my, my career choices. Um, growing up, I was probably like a lot of you, had a lot of different jobs, working on farms, uh, delivering newspapers, shoveling snow, uh, working at McDonald's and working at hardware stores. So anything that was around, I, uh, you know, I took a job and most people in the community were very, very similar. So uh, most of us came from you know, working families. So we all had to pay our education and we got jobs to do so. Um, but, but growing up early, early, very early on, I uh, always wanted to be a medical doctor. Um, there was one doctor in town, Dr. Nicholson, and I was sort of the ear apparent or the designated replacement for him uh, growing up. And in many cases, when someone got sick in the neighborhood, I actually went to stay with them and they, uh, to take care of them. So I always loved medicine and always dreamed of uh, of going and, and, uh, and uh, studying medicine. I did attend uh, St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. That's uh, also up the province there a little bit. I started there back in 1982 after graduation. I, um, I was studying science, uh, again, with pre-med. So I was look, taking a lot of science courses. Um, I majored in, in chemistry. I really enjoyed the chemistry and found that really fulfilling. And uh, I literally took every chemistry course I could find at the university, in fact, one of them, um, was uh, a one-to-one -one course with the Dean of Science. I was taking an advanced kinetics course. So anything I could take uh, in chemistry, I liked it and, and loved it. I uh, graduated in, in 1986 um, from St. Francis Xavier with, a, uh, with an honors in chemistry. Um, and at the time, again, maybe some, there's some undergrads on the phone, uh, on the phone here. I, uh, I applied to both medical school. I took my MCAS. Uh, and I also applied to graduate school. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get accepted in both areas, but... Um, uh, I decided to go to graduate school. Um, I accepted uh, an opportunity to go to University of Ottawa and to, to do chemistry with uh, Professor Jean Frechet. And uh, in the area of focus at the time I, I started working on was asymmetric synthesis of chiral compounds. These were you know, rather uh, difficult compounds to make and mostly uh, pharmaceutically oriented. Uh, after being in, in, in graduate school at University of Ottawa for six months, uh, my professor came to me and told me that he accepted a position at Cornell University down in Ithaca, New York. Um, and he had asked me if I wanted to go join them in Cornell and uh, complete my graduate studies. There were six of us at the time um, that were in his lab that decided to go. The other students and postdocs uh, were finishing up. So only six of us had to attend. And uh, I remember that was July of 87 when we actually went over to Cornell. And uh, I remember that why that's important is uh, we actually loaded up our entire research laboratory into two U-Hauls. Um, that includes chemicals and samples and laboratory equipment, literally everything. We wrapped it in our clothes and took our chemicals down and uh, drove from Ottawa down to Ithaca, New York. And, and that's about a five or six hour journey, two U-Hauls crossing the border, obviously pre 9-11. Um, so, you know, you figure six, six foreign, foreigners all in, uh, in two U-Hauls with loaded with laboratory equipment and chemicals crossing the border. 
certainly something that probably wouldn't happen today and, uh, and maybe a bit unique back then, but that's really how we set up our laboratory at Cornell. Um, we, uh, we, we, we built the laboratory, we set it all up. It was kind of fun to really have that experience of, of setting the laboratory up. Um, met some fantastic friends at, at Cornell uh, there at the time. I also decided to change the nature of my research. Uh, I got interested in uh, organic materials or polymers for electronic materials, for basically for fabricating semiconductors or circuit boards, displays, et cetera. But making chemicals, making polymers used to make what we, we call then photoresists. Um, these materials would go into uh, making semiconductors and, and they're still used today. But um, I like that research. And the reason I chose that area was because it was very applied. I could design a small molecule, synthesize a polymer, turn it into a formulation, and actually take that formulation and go test it on, on actual products, on actual uh, computer chips. So very applied type research, very exciting. Um, I liked it a lot. Uh, and at the same time, while I was doing the, my PhD, it was sponsored by uh, IBM. And uh, so I got to do some of my research out at Almaden, out in California, uh, at the IBM center out there. So. A lot of the work I did, I used to fly back and forth and, and test my products out there, work with the folks in Almaden as well. So getting some in industry experience at the same time and, and I really liked it. Um, the other great thing about Cornell was I actually met my wife. Um, she was a, uh, Robin was a, a PhD student studying uh, physical chemistry, um, laser. She was blasting apart ozone mole molecules and studying fragmentation patterns. So uh, I would to this day argue that she's the smarter of the two of us, but so I got very lucky and I met my wife there. And, and again, hope a lot of you have uh, had similar experiences in graduate school. Um, moving ahead to a, I, so I, I did my master's. And again, I think a lot of you that have go, gone through PhD programs, it's a necessary step along the way. And then finished my PhD in 91, 1991. Um, and I think a, a lot of you, you know, have you know, a, a decision to make, right? I mean, if you're coming out of graduate school, lots of different avenues. Um, do you want to go to industry? And uh, in, in the industry, do you want big companies, small companies? Um, you want to go on to do a postdoc, and perhaps there's some on the phone today that are actually doing postdocs. Um, some cases, do you want to go to uh, um, academia um, to become professors? Uh, uh, and other cases, do you want to leave and start your own company? So uh, you have a lot of choices, um, all exciting choices. I chose to go to uh, industry at the time, and thinking that if I ever chose to decide to go to uh, academia afterwards, maybe. I could go after uh, an industrial uh, career. So I chose to go to a, uh, go to chose, chose to go to industry. And uh, I remember interviewing at the time and a lot of uh, these corporate companies will come to your universities and they uh, certainly look to recruit. Um, that, that was such the case for me as well as I went out to other companies and applied for opportunities. And I remember interviewing at five companies at the time. I interviewed at IBM, which was a natural transition because I had done a lot of work with them during my graduate work. I interviewed with a company called Roman Haas, Monsanto, BASF, and Arco. And, uh, I still remember the advice my, my professor, uh, Jean Frochet, gave me going out the door during these interviews is that um, come back with five offers. Um, you don't have to accept them, obviously. You're not going to accept five. But, but go out and make the most of the interviewing process to at least get the offer. Because then when you come back, it's your choice whether or not to go there. Um, and so it's very important to obviously do a good job while you're at the interview. And even if you're thinking of not doing, not taking the job, it's still not a bad idea to come back with that offer because at least you have choices and, uh, and it's your choice as opposed to the company. So I still remember that advice. And, and, I, and fortunately I was lucky enough to get the five offers and, and uh, I chose IBM. Uh, obviously it was, it was natural for me because I had done so much work with them, um, but it was also going into IBM to continue a lot of the work that I had already done in my graduate work. I went there working on small molecules and polymers for, a, uh, for making microelectronics devices. So um, it was a more, a lot of the same thing, right? It was a, a continuation of what I did. And uh, you guys all know, but IBM was uh, candidly referred to as the big blue. Um, what I loved about IBM was it, was, it was like an industrial university. Very big, obviously at the time, several hundred thousand employees, but a lot of the laboratories that IBM had were very much akin to some of the laboratories that you'd see at universities. And the type of research that you did um, was very, very similar. It was, it was great. You could actually do some fundamental research or applied research. Um, it, was a, it was a great experience and a very nice transition from, um, from, uh, from Cornell University. I, uh, I entered the IBM executive program. They tap you to uh, some, some 
give you a chance to kind of come up the executive ladder. And so there's a little bit of extra courses you take at the, at the time while you're at Cornell as well. So, or sorry, at IBM as well. So um, a lot, I think a lot of corporations have executive programs and, and I enjoy them and I, I would encourage you to look at them as well. Um, but IBM, as I mentioned, it was an industrial university, incredible research going on in many fields, lots and lots of research resources, um, like all, a lot of big companies have incredible talent uh, available. So you'd meet a lot of folks in there that, that were absolutely incredible scientists and, uh, and people. So it was very, very, very good. Um, IBM was incredibly innovative. They worked on a lot of stuff that nece not necessarily went to market, but incredibly uh, innovations going on there at the same time, some great science going on. Um, my work, as I mentioned, focused on inventing new polymers. Um, what I really liked about IBM was I was able to, again, make small molecules, but I was able to take the small molecules and the polymers and actually go into manufacturing to scale these things up uh, in, at IBM. We had a, a manufacturing facility for making polymers. So I would take lab samples and make uh, um, literally thousands of, uh, of gallons of these materials uh, in larger vessels. So it was a, an experience in itself, but, but a lot of fun. I was able to scale them up and I was also then able to turn them into formulations and take them into uh, IBM fabs. And these are fabrication facilities where you can actually coat, the, coat your products on and making computer chips. So really getting to test the products out. And that was a lot of fun taking it all the way through that cycle. As I mentioned, you know, IBM had a lot of resources, um, but at the same time, big companies you'll find there's a lot of necessary systems and you know, generally a, a lot of hierarchy, um, a lot of sign-offs, um, but lots of history and culture. So you know, big companies, as, I, I would, as you would uh, imagine, have a lot, of, uh, a lot of everything going on. Um, but very quickly realized that you know, IBM's intent was really focusing on electronics and chemistry, making these chemicals um, that I was making wasn't really core to the business. Um, most of the resources at IBM were electrical engineers and uh, not a lot of chemists doing what I was doing. So if I wanted a, a career in chemistry in this field, IBM probably wasn't the best place for me. Um, and as I mentioned, IBM has lots of layers of management. Uh, I at least aspire to be CEO and I, I think, you know, saying there's 20 layers of management between myself as, a, as an engineer and the CEO at the time. Uh, John Akers uh, was our CEO. And uh, uh, there are a lot of layers there, a lot of places, a lot of ladders to climb, if you will, to make it up. And it's going to take a long time. At the same time, uh, IBM, our group, uh, in fact, formed an alliance. A lot of companies have alliances with uh, a development alliance with uh, universities and other companies. And ours did an alliance with a company called Shipley back in 1994. And uh, I became part of that. So a lot of the work I was doing was working with this small company called Shipley up in uh, Marlboro, Massachusetts. Um, I, I liked it a lot. Shipley was focused on chemistries for the electronics industry and more or less a natural fit for me. So in 1995, I, I made a, another tough decision, but uh, I was gonna leave IBM and join, uh, join Shipley in May of 1995. Uh, I wasn't the only one. I, IBM is, as I mentioned, the university and I would consider myself a graduate of, of IBM and, a lot of folks that you'll meet out there in industry today and perhaps even in universities, uh, they're graduates of IBM. They had some term at IBM and they learned a lot and moved on. And uh, um, that was kind of the nature of IBM at the time. A lot of folks were, were moving on. So uh, in, uh, in 1995, in May of 1995, I, I joined a company called Shipley. And Shipley was actually a division and, and owned by a, comp a larger company called Roman Haas. And, uh, I actually, as I mentioned earlier, I interviewed with Roman Haas uh, as one of my potential candidates, but didn't like it. Uh, they were doing a lot of paint chemistry at the time. They didn't realize they had Shipley, which was a division of electronics. So I joined in 1995 and uh, my wife at the time uh, had graduated from Cornell University and she was working at General Electric in Schenectady, New York. But we both made the decision. Uh, she was to leave uh, General Electric and I left IBM and we joined Shipley in 1995. Um, now, uh, I, I titled the, the section as I couldn't keep a job. Uh, Wonderful part about Shipley was lots of stuff to do, lots of opportunities. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, certainly wasn't nearly as big as IBM. Um, so I, I joined as what was called a product engineer in 1995. And the fun part about this was again, I could work with uh, R&D in, in, in the labs. I could work with engineering to, to scale these things up. I could work with manufacturing and manufacturing them. I could work with sales and marketing and, and bringing them out to market. And I get to work with customers as well. So I flew all around the world and taking some of our products and, installing them in their, in the, uh, their customers themselves. So one of my favorite jobs, you learned a lot. You got to work with, uh, with uh, tons of different talents across the uh, entire supply chain. 
as well as the uh, customer base. Uh, I, I did that role for roughly about a year and uh, I was lucky enough to be promoted into R&D manager. So I kind of went from the engineering side back to R&D and became an R&D manager uh, in 90, 1996. Uh, within a year, I, uh, I then got promoted to being a director of engineering. So back to my old area in engineering, but you now I took over the engineering function. Um, I, uh, I liked R&D that much. I added it on and became R&D director and engineering director at the same time. So a couple of them together. Um, be honest, it's probably a pretty natural fit because you know we were inventing molecules, inventing chemistries, and engineering was scaling them up. So a little bit of what I uh, what I like to do anyway, and so kind of added the both of them together. I moved my focus and uh, in 2000 to a uh, become the uh, an R and D and engineering director in something called Print and Wiring Board. Still a part of Shipley, but instead of the semiconductors, it was actually making circuit boards. So again, combining R and D and engineering and uh, and moving that over to uh, Print wiring board in 2000. Within a couple of years, I, I threw another little uh, role on there. It's called marketing director. So I had a R&D, engineering, and marketing, a little bit of everything. Um, as you can kind of see, it's getting closer and closer to being a general manager, which is really where I wanted to go eventually. But combining all those, those functions and uh, a lot of fun. I, again, I didn't get bored by any means because the various roles were all together. Some of the critical skill sets that you guys might be familiar with already, but but during that tenure, uh, what I call the tactical side of my career, managing people, um, it's not something that comes naturally. Uh, you do take a variety of courses uh, throughout your, uh, your professional career, and, and uh, there's most of the companies offer those courses, which is great. But it's, it takes a little bit to manage people and learn how to get the most out of, uh, out of individuals and be a good leader. Portfolio management, um, you're going to find as one of the absolutely critical skill sets that you're going to need um, and I, I think even in, in university, but certainly in the uh, in the industrial world, you're the whatever company you join, no matter how big it is, you're not going to have unlimited resources, uh, even though you might have a lot. And you're going to have to uh, prioritize where those resources go. And that's really what, where it goes into portfolio management uh, to decide where the best investments are, where the, are they real investments, and can you actually win those, right? So the whole portfolio management coupled with stage gate, I think a lot of these terms you might have heard before, but absolutely critical skill set. And I would encourage any of you, if you can get training in, in uh, portfolio management, it's, it's definitely worth it. And whether it's an investment portfolio from a financial perspective or a product portfolio or a market portfolio in an industrial world, very, very important. And almost equally as important, project management. Um, really understanding how to put a project together from start to finish and looking at all the, uh, all the um, essential elements of that and putting the timing and the critical milestones and resourcing uh, a lot of facets there, but, but a good project management uh, background, again, will do you absolutely wonderful in, in whatever industry career you, uh, you decide to take. Um, so, but, so I, again, most of those roles I talked about before um, were largely, and if not mostly on the, uh, the business, on the technical side, sorry. Um, I wanted, again, I, I really didn't want to be a CEO. And uh, as I mentioned, Shipley was part of Roman Haas. So I looked at Perhaps I could become the CEO of Roman Haas, but a lot less levels of management there. But as you start looking at it, well, some people call it a passport or whatever, but there's certainly certain skill sets and, and roles you'll need to take in industry if you do want to become, um, become a CEO, especially if you're going to start out on the technical side. Um, and it's certainly, you know, not, nothing, nothing else, a business role. You're going to need to run a business or have uh, some roles or responsibilities in that business side. And, and for those of you that are technical on the, on the, uh, on the call here, you know, I, I call it jumping to the dark side because you know you're now about to give up your your strengths and all your training and move over to the business world where perhaps you have less training. Um, so I, I took my first business role in 2003. Small business. Um, it was it was a, a business within Roman Haas uh, as general manager. Uh, our business that I took over only had 19 million in sales, so not a big one. And, and in fact, it was losing about at the time five million dollars. Of OPAT. This is this is operating pro operating profit after tax. And back in 2003, that was the way the way at least we measured profitability. And today, you know, we talk EBITDA, we talk uh, uh, economic value, and, and other things. But back then, it was called OPAT. That was the normal convention. So it was a small business losing money. Um, I called it like operating a small boat. And the reason I say that is uh, is as a small boat, there was ten. You know, you, you could look at ten levers on a small boat, perhaps. And every one of them is very is going to cause an issue and uh, cause of a cause of response, I should say. Um, so 
in a small business, I could focus on manufacturing and, and drive the business that way. I could focus on our R&D and drive it that way. I could focus on sales and marketing and drive it that way um, or supply chain, et cetera. So lots of different levers you could use to drive and grow the business. Um, and, and, and you start learning all those skill sets because as the president of those small businesses, you, you, you will wear all those hats, even though you might have great staff to, to help you, but, but you're gonna be involved in any one of these at any given time. And, and you know, if there's a downturn in the economy, you might have to push the, uh, push the manufacturing more because it's slowdowns, whatever. But anyway, there are lots of levers, lots of different ways of, of delivering the business results. And uh, you need to understand and learn over time which ones are the right ones to press at any given time. And they, uh, I, I certainly didn't have all the skill sets at the time as well. So um, Roman Haas sent me to Wharton to study uh, finance for executives, marketing for executives, and a few other courses. So as you'll find, and, and I would encourage you, if you go into industry, continue learning. Don't, don't ever stop learning. Take these courses and, and augment your skill set. Uh, most of us that grew up in the science world, you know, finance was a bit unique and marketing was a bit unique. And there's lots of programs out there that I would encourage you to go out and get. Um, again, as I mentioned, the opportunity to wear many hats, it was, again, you're never going to get bored. You're going to be a business person one day, a salesperson another day, manufacturing grew another day, an R&D guy. Um, while I was running this business, I was still writing patents and still doing, a, uh, doing active technical work. Um, I had the most fun. In, in fact, my, my mentor at the time, Pierre Brundeau, told me that in taking this role, it's gonna be your most fun, and it really was. Uh, so your first business role and, and the size that it was, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so over time, uh, it, the roles just got bigger and bigger in the, in the business area. I was in the, uh, that small business for a few years, and then in 2007, I was asked to become what was called a BUD, or a business unit director. I think this was the akin to general manager for the electronics division. Now this was 350 million. Um, my learnings were, it was that, you know, running a bigger business is a lot like running a smaller business, um, except now that speedboat became a tanker, right? So as you, as you start adjusting or touching those levers, it took a longer time to see your response and, uh, you know, rightfully so because it's, it's a bigger business. Um, uh, in 2007, uh, I was appointed a vice president of Roman Haas. Um, I was on my way to becoming CEO and my mentor uh, was, was of course, ahead of me at the time, and he was destined to become CEO. So I was kind of following along in his footsteps. And in doing so, I became vice president. Uh, unfortunately, in 2009, uh, things kind of stopped a little bit. Uh, Dow came in and, and paid, I think it was roughly $19 billion for Roman Haas. So they, they bought us, and we became part of Dow. Um, so I certainly wasn't going to become CEO of Roman Haas because it no longer existed. And uh, Dow at the time was roughly around $60 billion dollars. Roman Haas, uh, just by comparison, was probably around eight or nine billion at the time. So a little, little tougher, um, bigger business again, a lot bigger than Roman Haas, uh, getting closer to those IBM days. So I had quite a few layers between myself and the CEO of, uh, of Dow uh, at the time, Andrew Liveris. So it can be a little harder, but I still you know, thought about it. So I, uh, in 2010, I became uh, a business unit director for growth technology. So now, instead of one business, I had several smaller businesses all under my portfolio. And that, that tool I talked to you about earlier about portfolio management becomes even more important now because you got to manage resources across many businesses at one time. So it's a lot of portfolio management. And a lot of these businesses were growth businesses. So not a lot of deep resources in them, but uh, and all different markets. We were in military. We were in metal organics. We were in uh, display and uh, solar. So a lot of different markets. Uh, in 2014, I moved from that role and became a business unit director for semiconductor technologies. This is my first billion dollar business that I was running and they, uh, again, full general management. So having the entire operations, sales, marketing, R&D, uh, literally everything under that umbrella. But now I, I crossed the billion dollar threshold. At the same time, and, and you'll, you'll, some of you guys will probably certainly have this opportunity, is uh, I, I was asked to join the board of directors for uh, another company. And... You know, a lot, a lot of companies like Dow will actually allow you to accept a board position. In fact, they encourage it in many cases because it gives you very different experience than actually working in a company. Now you're on the board and you're really a fiduciary, fiduciary for that company and you advise them. Um, and, you know, you're, this was a public company, but a, uh, um, it, it's a very different role and another set of experience, which is, which is again, very, very good for you. 2015, uh, the business uh, role became bigger. I was asked to become the president of Dow Electronic Materials. This was now a $2 billion business. 
getting a little bit bigger, more responsibility. Um, 2017, Dow actually restructured um, one of their alliances called Dow Corning. And the biggest thing that happened was Dow and DuPont actually merged. So one of the biggest chemical mergers out there in the industry. And, uh, uh, and then 2017, I was asked to become the president of now what was called Dow DuPont Electronics and Imaging. Um, so my 2 billion business became 5 billion. 2 billion from Dow, 2 billion from DuPont, and uh, about another billion from the Dow Corning. So um, we created the largest uh, electronics materials company in the world. Um, I, uh, I had a, a job for a couple of years to integrate those three businesses, you know, looking at both cost synergies as well as growth synergies. And as you start talking about mergers and acquisitions, if some of you get in there, you'll always talk those terms, right? If what cost synergies or what costs can I take out to, to make it more profitable? And what growth synergies can I look at growing the business more? You don't want to lose your customer base. So maintaining customers and maintaining your talent is obviously very, very key. Um, another big change. 2019, uh, I said, all right, I did it all. I, I wasn't going to become CEO of, of Dow or DuPont at the time because they moved on quite a bit. Um, really enjoyed my corporate experience, but time for another change. And I was uh, enticed to go work in the private equity world. And again, that might be an opportunity for some of you on the phone today. And very different world again. Um, you'll find the private equity companies, and there's lots of them out there. Some are focused on small, short, shorter term deals. Some are focused on longer term deals, creating more value. And there's a, a, a litany in between there of all different size companies. So very exciting. Um, make sure you know your finance is good. Um, but I, I was brought in largely as an advisor because I, I knew electronics for 30 years at the time. And I was helping them to advise on what companies to buy, what ones not to buy, how to do deals and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. It was just a good experience. Um, uh, but at the same time, I, 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 was, uh, I was asked, I, I interviewed for a job at a company called HCL. And, uh, and that was a great opportunity that, that I looked, looked uh, you know, at, at my opportunities going forward. And HCL was, was a good company. Um, you know, it's a small company, but, you know, here you have a chance to create culture. Um, again, with small companies, not as many resources. You go back to wearing many hats, um, which, again, I really enjoyed. Small deeds make really big differences in a company that's, that's small. Uh, and uh, one, one of the big learnings I've learned though, coming through full cycle from the small companies to big companies is that in a small company, those critical processes like portfolio management, project management, some of those tools, stage gate, really, really are needed in small companies as well. So a lot of those invaluable learnings you can really tap into. Right, real, real quick uh, uh, to pay the bills here, a little bit about HCO. Um, I think if any of you have electronics out there, and I'm sure many of you have smartphones or perhaps earbuds or maybe some of their wearable electronics. Uh, unfortunately, those electronics probably get, get hit with you know, in water sometimes. You might drop them in a puddle or perhaps in a swimming pool or shower. Um, not good. We actually provide technology um, that coat your electronics, a special, very, very special coating over those electronics that will allow it to be protected from the water. And what we call it, we're protecting from the inside out, right? So we provide special coatings over that electronic circuit board, those chips inside there, so that even if your device went in the water, the electronics are still going to be good, um, and so we do. So we, we work with them. Um, we work on most of the products that I uh, you probably see out there, and hopefully a lot more going forward. But it's a it's a, a younger company, so only a several years old, but there's a lot of growth out there that we're seeing, and and uh, we're enjoying it. Um, so just a couple of slides here to capture some learning, and they, uh, you you know you probably saw these sayings over time, but you know I think what I've learned you know in in with regards to change and risk you're gonna have lots of changes. There's, you know, whether it's university or whether it's an industry, and as I mentioned, all these acquisitions going back and forth, change is always gonna be there. Um, I would say embrace it, you know, maximize, you know, what you can do with it, em evolve. Uh, you know, Jeff Bezos constantly talks about Amazon and Amazon evol evolving and, you know, what started out as an online book retailer, you look at the size and scope of Amazon today, it's amazing what they're into, but they continue to evolve. The world's gonna keep evolving and so I really, I encourage you to, to change with it. Um, don't be afraid to fail. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things you'll learn going forward. You're always going to have failures. Learn from them, obviously. Fail fast. But, but whatever you do, take a chance and, and don't be afraid to fail and learn from it. The only thing I'd say is as you move into management roles, let your employees fail. Let, it, but they're going to have to take chances. They're going to fail. And I think as a good manager, you're going to need to help them, help them learn from those. But let them fail. Don't, don't condemn them. And obviously, don't make them fearful of failing. Um, and the new word for failure inside is pivot. So if something's not working, you know, pivot away from it. But um, it's really what I would encourage you to do. I, 
you're going to find as you go through your jobs and your many jobs, hopefully, um, you'll get complacent at times. Um, I would encourage you to take a risk. I change roles, as you've seen every few years. Um, but one of the things really important about just don't make a change and don't accomplish and not accomplish something. Uh, very important. If you want to move ahead and, and, and get promoted through your career, make sure you accomplish something in your role. Don't just go to a role and say, hey, look, I did this, I did this. Make a notable accomplishment uh, along the way. So you can say, hey, I was in this role, but I accomplished this. That's very, very important. You'll see resumes with people in roles um, just because they were in these roles, but with no accomplishments, and not a good thing. On the personal side, uh, you know, I would say, look, as you're about to choose a career, pick something that's going to make you happy. Uh, I've been doing electronics for 30 years. I love it. I really enjoy the industry, and, and uh, not everybody would, but you're going to spend a lot of time. Uh, your career is going to occupy a lot of your time, so I would encourage you to, do, uh, to get something that's going to make you happy. Um, but at the same time, if you pick something that's not making you happy, just change. Don't worry about it. Uh, as you've seen from myself, I, I went through a lot of changes, and I enjoy it. Um, as you do uh, go up the ladder and as you start looking at where you want to get to, don't be afraid of the lateral moves. I took seven lateral moves, uh, no promotions to be perfectly honest, all across the board, just to get the necessary training that I knew I wanted because I did want to be CEO and I wanted to be a president of a company and I knew I had to get training. So I took lateral moves. So don't be afraid just to get the necessary training, to take these lateral moves and to move around. Um, get the right mentor. Uh, I'll tell you, there's bad stories about there about people choosing the wrong mentor out there, to be honest. And if you choose the wrong mentor, that unfortunately leaves the company. You're kind of left in limbo there. So you know, try to choose the right one. And you know, it's not always the easiest thing to do, but but uh, I tell you, it's invaluable when you have one. Um, you know, a lot of people over the years uh, come to me and, and they're looking for promotions, and uh, which you'll you'll find happens. But I, I'm telling you, advancement really is a result of an opportunity or an opening. Um, the capability and achievement. And so you can be really good, but if you didn't achieve anything, you're probably not gonna get promoted. If you uh, are really, really good and achieved a lot and you have all this capability, if there's no opening, it's probably gonna be difficult to get promoted as well. So really it's the advancing is the result of all three of these. Get noticed. Um, the last thing you wanna do is to kind of hide, hide away in a corner. And if you wanna do that, you know, I'm sure there's roles for that, but if you want to advance, uh, get noticed. And I would say get noticed for the right reasons, right? There's, a lot of times you'll get noticed for the wrong things, but, but get noticed for the right reasons. Um, if you're looking to advance your career as well, I, I would say hire and create your uh, replacement. Um, one of the, the reasons I've seen people not being promoted, to be perfectly honest, is they're so critical in their role that if they got moved at that role, you know, the business would be impaired. Um, and that's unfortunate, but it's, it's just a fact of life. So really look to hire your replacement, train your replacement so that you are available to, uh, to be moved ahead. A lot of managers, you'll, you'll find a lot of people are worried about hiring the replacement just, just, just because they think they'll be replaced um, ad hoc. But, but really, the best thing to do is to hire a replacement. It just allows you to, to move on. Um, the other thing I, I recommend is don't try to get ahead by taking others down. I've seen that happen, and I've seen people do that over, over you know, uh, it might work a couple of times, but, you know, in the long run, you know, they don't forget. Um, so last thing, just don't, don't try to get ahead by, uh, by taking people down. Um, management. Uh, what I've I found too, fortunately, is a uh, as you don't have to be the smartest or have the right answers, and they uh, um, always have a good team because uh, if you have a good team with with uh, with that are the smartest team you can put together, the answer is probably there somewhere. So don't worry about always having the right answer. Just again, have the right process and the right team um, to have, to come up with those right answers. Uh, a lot of folks sometimes are right, but they just don't get things to happen as well. And so I, I say be effective and. Uh, Effective is getting the job done the right way. And uh, again, it's not always about being right. As I mentioned, picking the best team, uh, surround yourself with talent smarter than you. Uh, a lot of, lot of uh, managers I've seen over the years don't wanna do that because again, they don't wanna have people who are challenging them, but I, I, I would argue um, go the other way. Hire folks who are a lot smarter than you that are kind of constantly challenge you and, and bring the, uh, the value of your group up. Um, last thing you don't wanna do, do though is tell, how, tell those smart people and tell these your staff how to do their job. You know, you certainly can set direction and that is your role, but don't tell them how to do their job. Um, I never wanted to be told how to do my job. I get bored doing that. So really make sure your, your group is a, uh, you set the right direction, but allow them to do their job. Certainly support them and, and remove barriers, but, but again, let them do that job. Um, manage with a heart, but don't make a, don't be afraid to make tough decisions. Uh, a lot of people try to turn themselves into, into some, let's say some mean people or whatever you want to call it, but um, 
you don't have to. You, you really don't have. You can you can still manage with a heart, but at the same time, you just make these tough decisions, unfortunately, or restructurings or whatever you have to do. Um, but just do it from your heart. Leverage your strengths. Uh, as you know, I, I've got trained as being a chemist, and I think to this day, I'm still using my chemistry. I'm still in the laboratories here at HCO, talking with the scientists, talking with the engineers about chemistry. Um, even most of my roles, uh, uh, I've done. I still continue to patent. Uh, I didn't write papers, but I still continue to patent uh, technologies and stuff like that. I, as a as a business leader, I manage as a chemist. Um, we're in a technical world, a technical field, so that was one of my strengths, and I continue to leverage it. Um, always leave a place better than you found it, and I would say obviously leave a person better than you found them as well. But just try to improve it. I mean, just you know, make it accomplish, make make a uh, contribution that improves wherever you go. Uh, and, and, and a job or a role or a person, like I said, if you can make them feel better, um, do it. Uh, make it fun. Again, this is, you know, you're gonna hopefully have a long career. So if it's not fun, do something else. Um, what I always try to do about myself was, you know, I always try to do the right thing. I constantly ask myself, you know, as we hit a problem, you know, what, the, what is the right thing to do? And I, in fact, I've asked my staff that on occasion, you know, what, what's the right thing here and, and how do we do it? Um, You'll always be, you'll always find that uh, someone somewhere will be asking about you and what will they say? What I mean by this is, is, you know, look, be careful on who you cross, right? And you're going to meet a lot of people in network, a lot of people over the years. And I, you know, I hate to use the word, don't, don't upset them or whatever, but someone's going to ask someone about you at some point in time. And uh, you don't know who that is. So be really careful about how you leave that person or what you do to that person. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hopefully, hopefully you're going to have a long career. So it's really, really be very, very careful there. Um, it's a small world, getting smaller, don't burn bridges, and probably similar to, to statement number two, but you know, I, I've went through a lot of companies um, and uh, I'm still really good friends and I have still good relationships. In fact, I still good partnerships. So a lot of those companies that I've worked with over the years, you know, I still work with them and I still work with the folks there and I'm still good. I have still good alliances with them because they become partners going forward as part of your network. So whatever you do, don't burn bridges. Um, and lastly, strike the right balance between family and work. Uh, I really, this, I'll just tell you, I've got two sons, a, a 20 year old son and a 22 year old son. I have never ever missed a birthday, uh, one of their birthdays growing up with my career. And I've been all over the world and you know, for a lot of my, my travel, but I've always made it home to be with them on their birthday. And just my point being is that family is, is first and foremost. Uh, you, know, you, you really wanna make sure that you, you, you put that as your top priority. But I would also argue that you know, I, I've, I've had a good career and I, I enjoy work. You can balance it. You can have both a lot of, I know folks out there might say you can't have a, a really good family relationship and a really good work uh, environment, but I would, I would argue otherwise. And I've known a lot of people that, uh, that are that way. You can have the best of both worlds and you can, have, you can make this work. Um, with that, uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, I'm open to any and all questions. Thanks, Jim. I'm sure that you fill out the attendance sheet and please join me in thanking thanking uh, Jim for his talk. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to drop them into the chat on the YouTube stream. So thank you, uh, Jim, and we really appreciate it. Uh, so everyone take care uh, and we'll have our next job search strategies uh, next week. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Joe. Take care, guys.